I noticed that uh, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, we had some visitors with us in Bible class today, and, and I believe here in the assembly now as well, and I know we already did this, but I like to do it again often, and just extend a welcome to our visitors. We are glad to have you in our midst. We want you to feel welcome, and we want to be of help to you in knowing God's will for your life that's revealed in His Word, the Bible, and to help you understand uh, the way of salvation in Christ so that you can be sure you're going to heaven. There's nothing more important than that this morning. And so we rejoice as God's people in His presence as we, we come together another Lord's Day. And yet every time, uh, even though it may seem a, a routine and it's something we might take for granted, every time is a privilege, every time is a blessing and every time is tremendously significant. And I want you to think about that for a minute. We, we understand as we come together today what we're doing. We're worshiping God. John 4, 24, we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. So the what is something we often teach and discuss and that we often emphasize, but just as important, it's critical we understand why we're doing what we do, what worship is about, what the whole point of it is. So you might think of these questions with regard to worship. There's the, there's the what, and we're engaging now in this assembly. We're singing, we're praying, you're hearing the word. We've gathered around the table to, take the, to eat the bread and take the cup. We put something into the collection. We understand what we're doing, but it's important we understand for whom we're doing it. Uh, who is the object of our worship? Whom are we worshiping? All right, that's a fundamental question. How we're to engage in these things is critical. So here again, I can speak to our visitors and emphasize to all of us that we're striving to follow the biblical pattern that God gave to his church for how we worship God. He has given us in his word this pattern of what constitutes acceptable worship in his sight. All of those things are important, and we've looked at them in the past, and we will continue to study those kinds of questions. But maybe I haven't emphasized as much in my own teaching the why. So the what, the whom, the how, the why. That's what I want to focus on. And I think if we, if we think about why we're to worship, we'll be more urgent and desirous of worship. It will be more meaningful to us. It won't be a mere routine. It won't certainly be a drudgery. It won't be something that we would just casually miss and fail to participate in when we're able to. We'll want to worship and it will be a more meaningful experience to us. So that's part of why I'm looking at what I am with you. And this is the first part of this lesson that will continue, Lord willing, next time um, in, in two weeks. We have a guest speaker uh, next week, so I'm looking forward to that. But I'm going to call this lesson, Why Worship? Why Worship? Just write those two words down. If you're taking notes, you know what to do, right? Put them there at the top of the page. And let's look at this uh, question here. We worship, first of all, because God is worthy of our worship. Now, there are a lot of reasons we can think of for why we ought to praise God, but we should understand fundamentally it's something we owe to God. It is something due Him because He is worthy simply being God. He is worthy of our worship. Psalm 29, 2, I like, we're going to use the Psalms a lot here, the worship book of Israel and of the early church and of the church today even. Psalm 29, 2, give unto the Lord the glory, the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So it's something I should understand that uh, I owe to God. I will call upon the Lord, Psalm 18, 3. We sing this sometimes. Who is worthy. He's worthy to be praised. In the uh, throne scene in Revelation 4 and 5, where John sees the heavenly beings 
praising God around the throne. And he hears praise given to God in these terms. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. We'll come back to that. But then to the Lamb who's sitting at the right hand of the one on the throne. Worthy, chapter 5, verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb that has been slain. And then you have the sevenfold praise to receive the power, the riches, the wisdom, the might, the honor, the glory, and the blessing. He's worthy to be praised. And, of course, we mentioned a moment ago the whom, whom we are to worship. God and God alone, we need to emphasize here, is worthy of our worship. Now, this is a point we might take for granted, but it's something especially, I think, we need to emphasize in our time. You remember when the devil was trying to attempt Jesus to fall down and worship him. Jesus replied, Matthew 4, 10, he cited scripture, he appealed to Deuteronomy. It is written, he said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. Him only you shall serve. Exodus, you remember in the Decalogue, when Moses brought down the tables of stone with the commandments for Israel, we find here, you shall have no other gods before me. Right there at the beginning, the first commandment. You shall not make for yourself the carved image. The first and second commandment. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For Notice this, this the, because God is a, a jealous God. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He says this later in chapter 34, 11 of Exodus. You shall worship no other God. See, they... They were in the midst of pagan peoples who all had their own deities. And God said, I, I will not tolerate a divided allegiance. You can worship no other God because there is no other God, of course. But he says, uh, no other God for Yahweh, the Lord, whose name is Jealous. He's a jealous God. In other words, he will not tolerate giving the devotion that is due only to him to someone else. Just like if you truly love your spouse, then you'll have a healthy jealousy, not a suspicion. Not, I know we generally use that word in a negative sense, but there's a positive sense where you care. If your spouse is giving attention and affection to someone else that belongs only to you, right, that stirs up these feelings of jealousy because you care and that relationship is to be exclusive. And see, that's how it is with God. He's a jealous God. And so we should Fear him in that regard. He says, Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Now we might think, well, none of these things has anything to do with us today because we don't have idolatry in our day. Well, of course we do. Of course we do. Not crass idolatry. It's not prevalent like that where we have temples where people go in and fall down before images. But certainly we have idolatry where people will give their devotion to something in the place of God that belongs only to God. Paul said that was the fundamental sin of the Gentiles in antiquity. It's the fundamental sin of mankind. Romans 1.21, although they knew God, he said they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So what, what happens when we do that? We don't worship nothing. We put a substitute in God's God's place, we're worshiping beings. And if we don't worship God, we'll find something else to give allegiance to, to give devotion to. So they exchange the truth about God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so we, we find idolatry prevalent everywhere in our culture where people are uh, following their own desires and their own, the idols of their own hearts that are taking the place of God rather than giving thanks to Him and devoting themselves to Him. Well, He's worthy. We could think of it this way. There's a lot of different ways that I suppose you could approach this, but I think this is a, a, a useful way to look at it. God is worthy because of who He is, and what he does, and of course these things are related because God does what he does because of who he is, right? But I want us to think here now of who he is, and especially, we find this emphasis, especially in the Bible, that we're going to look at for the rest of the lesson. We think about God being worthy of worship because of who he is. Over and over in Scripture, we see that God is to be praised 
because he is our creator. This is where we're going to focus now for the rest of the lesson. As our creator. Now there are other things God is to us by which uh, or which form the basis of uh, praising him or that are part of the reason we should praise him. And we'll look at some of that as well. But notice cr- here, because simply by virtue of the fact that he created us. Now look at Psalm 33. It's a great praise psalm. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Well, what would motivate me to praise? Well, notice how he goes on to to look at the world, to look at the creation. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He talks about the created order. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? Why? Because he made everything simply by speaking it into existence. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. To think that God simply spoke the universe into existence. That should cause us to fall down before him and praise him. And this is the language you notice we already looked at, we mentioned this verse, Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And why did he create them? For his glory. All of creation is to give glory to God. Psalm 48, we sometimes sing that way. We invite all of the created order to give praise to God. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So we're here by the will of God. And simply by the fact that he made us, he is worthy of our worship. So we find this again and again in the Psalms. Come, let us worship and bow down. That's the posture of worship. We're doing that in a spiritual sense right now, I hope. In our hearts, we have knelt before our maker Kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand, and he has made us, the psalm says. Psalm 100, make a joyful shout to the Lord. You see, this should invigorate our worship. Contemplating this should put the joy in our worship. He said, uh, shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve, that's another way of referring to worship. Come before his presence. Right? That's what we're doing right now. We're entering into His presence. We need to think of being before His throne. Visualize worship that way. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. And here's this point I'm making. Our Creator. It is He who has made us. The fact that He is the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. He's the one who made us, not we ourselves. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. He created us, and then he recreated us as his people in Christ as well. Uh, But notice, simply by virtue of the fact that he's the creator. And look how we could, look at all the ways that we could contemplate this. Think of, for example, Psalm 8. When you look at what God has created. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic, one translation says, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. And then he talks about how the, as he looks to the sky and he sees the creation. When I consider your heavens, the work, it's all the work of your fingers. Notice describing God as making everything this way. The moon and the stars which you've set in place. And what's, what, He couldn't wrap his brain around, will be, I suppose, the way we would say it, is that a God so mighty who could make all of these great and glorious things that he would care about, about, about us is what filled him with wonder. But notice, he talks about the stars. He talks about the heavenly bodies. And just looking up from his vantage point and seeing the heavenly bodies, that was enough to cause him to rejoice, and to give glory to God. Just think if David could know what we know about the universe now in our modern age. 
the things that we've been able to see now with our telescopes, our earthbound telescopes, and then, you know, the Hubble telescopes brought us back historic images of the far reaches of the universe. Now the James Webb, the first images coming back from the James Webb uh, uh, satellite telescope uh, that has been launched out into space. I don't know if I'm using the right terms here. The James Webb telescope, it's called, right? But these images that have come back, and the way that they de depict, it, we, we know something David could have never even imagined. The, the trillions upon trillions of stars, the billions upon billions of light years that separate the, the, the stars from each other, and the, and the uh, trillions of galaxies, and the, and the vast space and expanse between them, and all the phenomena of, of the astrological heavens, as we might think of it. He couldn't know what we now know. And my point is then, if it, let me say it colloquially, colloquially if it blew David's mind to see what he did, and if it, he w felt so compelled to worship just from his limited observations about the creation, how much more? How much more should we look and be compelled to worship and to fall before the Creator who could make such a glorious, such a vast universe? How can people look at the expanse of the universe and its beauty and not see the glory of the Creator? That there must be the order of the universe. There must be an orderer who set all these things in place. That you cannot just have an explosion that orders the universe in the way that we see it ordered. So there must be an orderer. There must be something transcendent behind this universe and this world. Myself. That is unimaginably powerful, infinite in power and majesty. Think about what we can know now. Now, look, let's go even further. Psalm 104. He, here the psalmist invites us to contemplate the, the, the world we live in here. What we see around us here on earth. David was looking to the sky. Here, notice, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. We give God majesty. It's the Latin word for great, for greatness. It's a way of acknowledging his greatness. And then in that psalm, we look around at the beauty of creation. You look past the palm trees, you forget about those, and look past to the beautiful things in creation, right? But uh, we, we see images from places around the world that are breathtaking in their beauty. And even in the things around us in the, in the living creatures, the, the psalm, that Psalm 104 goes on to speak of the various animals, of the mountains, of the trees, of the bodies of water. If you've ever stood at the, on the shore at the edge of the of the sea and contemplated its vastness and listened to its roaring. All of these things he brings to mind. When you think of birds in flight, you know, the elephant to me is an especially majestic creature striding the earth that makes me think of the, the greatness and the majesty of God. And I mentioned in a recent Bible class how thrilled I was when we were in St. Louis recently because I got to see fireflies again. And I saw them as a kid growing up in western New York we saw them all the time in Virginia. We moved here. I haven't seen them, just a brief glimpse of one or two in the five years we've been here. And, uh, and then right after I mentioned it, Don said he went home and had fireflies in his backyard that, w that, that next day or uh, that, that, that very night or that week. So uh, apparently there still are some around. They're hiding from me. But when we were in St. Louis, I stayed out one night and just for an hour stood there praying and watching all the fireflies just lighting up uh, throughout the uh, woods that surround our daughter's house there. And you know, recently the Andersons went to the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee where people go. There are a couple of weeks every summer where people travel from all over the country and maybe the world to see uh, the fireflies that are are. Uh, that are so uh, densely 
packed in that area and that populate that region and it's just light up. When I see that, when I see that, I think God, only God would think of having an, a, an insect like this that would light up. It, it almost makes me excuse roaches. When I think, why the roaches? Every time I see a roach, and I, and I have to grab it because Kim comes and gets me, and I have to go kill it, and I have to squish it with my hands in a, in a paper towel, and I think, why the roaches, Lord? Why the roaches? But maybe because the fireflies are so glorious, there had to be something hideous to sort of offset that. I don't know. That's just my thinking. But I see, I see something like that, and it just it, it makes me fall down before God and praise God for such beauty, for something so delightful. So in other words, we're surrounded every day by reminders in all the created order, in every plant, every tree, everything we see is a reflection of God. Even the fuzzy, cute things, you know, we look at a, a, cute, little, a cute little kitten, high five in here, but it contrast creatures like that, soft and fluffy when they're little, and then uh, what, what that psalm goes on to describe is the Leviathan, this fierce, massive creature that's described at length in Job 41. This is a depiction from a children's book on dinosaurs in the Bible. Some think that could be a reference to a dinosaur-like sea creature, uh, which is something we could discuss another time. But then, so as he looks at all of that, that's when he says, I'll sing to the Lord as long as I live, he, he looks at all of these kinds of things and he says, I will praise God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May the Lord see that these things saturate my mind and my heart and I think about them and I contemplate his majesty and I will praise him because I cannot help but praise him when I see these things and I realize his mighty hand behind it. But then we can go further and look at, the, the living creatures, look at yourself. David, in Psalm 139, he says, you formed my inward parts. He's thinking about his, the human body, a human being. You covered me in my mother's womb, so I will praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Now, here again, like we were saying with the heavenly bodies and how limited David's knowledge was compared to what we can see and what we know today, same with the wonders of the human body. We have technology today that allows us to realize far more than David could have ever dreamed of the wonders of the systems of the human body, and they're their staggering complexities and all that comes together, the mysteries of the brain. You know, I know they could see a brain. They could open up the head of a dead person and see the brain in there. But the things that we've learned about uh, the impulses in the brain and the things that still remain a mystery to us. But the, now, now because of microbiology, we can see the cells and understand the process the, the complexity of human blood and all the elements and how they uh, travel throughout the body and how oxygen is exchanged. Just think of the cell, the cell, the, the staggering complexity. The cell is a whole universe of biological machines all interacting precisely, all interdependent, carrying out complex operations just for the living function of that, of that cell. You know, even in the early days of the microscope, the cell just looked, even though people in the ancient world couldn't even know about these structures, but even before the electron microscope, in the early days of low-powered microscopes, it just looked like a blob of protoplasm. And they could not have imagined as we were able to look closer and closer. We have the telescopes that allow us to look out and the microscopes that allow us to look in at what God has created in the cell, in the nucleus of the cell of every living organism, the, the complex, the DNA code for life, the pr protein strands that form the genetic pattern that instructs every cell what to build, how to construct itself the blueprint for life. We have, my, 
again, do you see what I'm saying? We have even more reason to praise God. And what does he say in this very context? He stands in wonder of how it all begins in the womb. Notice he said, you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. And then after the part we already noticed about, uh, I will praise you because I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Then he goes on in the next couple of verses, my frame, talking about his his little body was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and intricately, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. That's a Hebrew idiom for the womb. So I was, I was intricately put together in the womb and your eyes saw my substance, my unformed substance. And the days that were written for me, all of them are written in your book when as yet there were none of them. He, he contemplates life in the womb and that you made me and my mother to think of the wonder of the formation of a human being inside of a human being and then grows and emerges from a woman. And, of course, they could see from ver by various means uh, fetal development in the womb, unfortunately, from either miscarriage and, and things of that nature, but could, could not have the window into the womb of, of the, the things that we can see, the little precious unborn children in the womb sucking their thumbs and uh, all the things that now that we've learned from embryology and from human embryology and uh, from the technology that allows us to access the wonder, the sheer wonder of life in the womb. It, it, uh, you know I have to mention this, but it, it staggers my mind that they're having hearings right now in Congress about abortion and in all the discussion about pregnancy termination and women's rights and all, all of the euphemisms that are used to cloud what abortion is, the killing of a human being. The question that never seems to arise in the minds of those who promote abortion is what about the baby? This is a baby in the womb, and, and, it, and it shouldn't be viewed as something to be disposed of, but as a creation of God that should compel us to praise Him, to fear Him, and to stand in awe of Him, and to praise His holy name. I think about how you made me in my mother's womb, and I will praise you, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's where it all begins. And so all of that, the, see, we have, my point is, from our modern vantage point, with all the technology we have, we have all the more reason. We can multiply what David says a thousand and ten thousand times over because of what we see in the creation all around us every day. And then we can, we can contemplate as well as we continue who God is. He not only made us, but what he's done for us, that he is our redeemer. See, that's where we can bring in who he is with what he's done in contemplating that. And of course, what he has done for us ultimately in Christ and in the cross of Christ. But as you think about all of that, can't we see the value? And I don't mean just assembling for worship, but to praise God in our prayers and give him thanks daily, Throughout the day, it should be a natural part of all that we are. But can't we look at this and see the importance of, of assembling with the people of God to worship? Oh, how could we miss it when we're able to be there? Are you making the worship of God a priority? Is it something you're anxious to do that you're longing to do and you wouldn't want to let anything keep you from? Are you giving to God the glory due His name. Right? Whatever personal benefits we get out of worship, we need to understand, yes, it's a blessing to us, but it's something we owe to God. You need to worship God. You need to be in the assembly of the people of God to give praise to the Lord God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. What beautiful things to contemplate I hope we're grateful for this opportunity, and I hope you understand that this is something we do 
as God's people, we're able to enter into his presence and give us our praise because by the blood of Christ, we've been sanctified, we've been made holy. And that's what you need to be, to respond to the gospel, to be sanctified, to be cleansed by the blood of Christ so that you can enter into his presence, the presence of a holy God and offer him your praise, your self. And if we can help you do that, let us know. Let's stand and sing this song together.